he is not only well, we've got such a great speaker, he's going to go through the abstracts and then he's going to do a state of the art talk on positioning therapy and IBD. Then we'll have time for questions. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here. Welcome to everybody. Uh, I carry forward what Marianne had started. We'll talk about some abstracts at DDW. I'll focus on both observational studies as well as some clinical trials. Uh, these are my disclosures. The three main things that I'll talk about uh, that I want you to remember from this talk is I'll present a clinical trial called the POWER trial where in patients with Crohn's disease who have inadequate response with initial ustekinumab, reinduction with IV ustekinumab may be beneficial. We'll uh, talk about data from the PREDICT cohort in the UK, which talks about the role of diet in relapse in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And what, we, what they observed is that high meat intake may be associated with an increased risk of relapse in patients with ulcerative colitis, but not Crohn's disease. I'll present data from an Australian clinical trial which talks about the role of combination therapy with vedolizumab. And what they observed is that thiopurine withdrawal in patients who are treated with vedolizumab combination therapy may worsen some clinical outcomes without a significant impact on drug concentration. So let's dive in into each individual abstract. Um, I will try to summarize my take home uh, from that abstract at the end of this. So this was the POWER trial uh, looking at IV reinduction with ustekinumab in patients with Crohn's disease. We all know and recognize that there is a subset of patients who are treated with ustekinumab will have a partial response to the medication or may initially respond and gradually have a secondary loss of response wherein they may, need, may start to notice relapse of symptoms by week six or seven on maintenance therapy. So this was a phase 3B multicenter randomized control trial evaluating that subset of patients to see whether reinduction with an IV dose of ustekinumab followed by maintenance and continuation of every eight weeks ustekinumab is more efficacious than continuing every eight week ustekinumab. This clinical trial again patients were randomized into one of two arms, uh, either to receive an IV dose of reinduction or continue their every eight weeks ustekinumab. I do want to emphasize that even in the patients who receive the IV dose, they still continued their subcutaneous dose every eight weeks. So their maintenance was not escalated to every four weeks afterwards, which is somewhat different from at least what I do in my clinical practice for somebody who may have a secondary loss of response. The primary outcome was looking at recapturing clinical response defined as a CDI score decline of more than 100 points at week 16. And they looked at multiple secondary endpoints, including objective markers of inflammation, biomarkers, and endoscopic outcomes at week eight and 16 after randomization. These are the key results for the trial, and I'll highlight here the primary outcome of the study. So again, like I mentioned, the primary outcome of the study was to look at clinical response or recapturing that clinical response with reinduction versus continuation of every eight weeks. This was not statistically different. So 47% of patients who were randomized to IV reinduction achieved clinical response as compared to 38% of those who were randomized to continuation of every eight week use to kinemab. However, if you look at a multitude of objective markers of inflammation with fecal calprotectin, uh, endoscopic improvement, we consistently see improvements with IV reinduction uh, with, in patients who have a partial response to use to kinemab. So the conclusions here, uh, IV ustekinumab reinduction versus continuation of every eight week ustekinumab in patients who experience secondary loss of response did not meet the primary endpoint of clinical response at week 16. However, there was clear evidence of decrease in objective, objective markers of disease activity with improvement in endoscopic endpoints as well as biomarker endpoints. So what is my take home? I think IV ustekinumab reinduction is a viable option in patients who experience secondary loss of response uh, to subcutaneous ustekinumab. This was a systematic review that we had done looking at observational studies predating this clinical trial, close to around 1,000 patients with, treated with ustekinumab who experienced secondary loss of response. And there was variable either reinduction and or escalation to every four week ustekinumab. And close to 55% of people who experienced secondary loss of response did achieve clinical response with either of these interventions. In my clinical practice, typically in a patient who is experiencing clinical loss of response, i.e. they're symptomatic, I would generally try to give them an additional IV dose and escalate simultaneously to every four week use to kinemab. Uh, 
I do not necessarily rely on ustekinumab trough concentrations to inform these decisions. For a patient who's telling me clearly that they do well when they get ustekinumab, but it's by week six or so, they start to notice loss of response. Moving on to the next study, this was a prospective cohort study looking at the association between meat intake at baseline and the risk of IBD flare. Uh, this was presented by Charlie Lees from the PREDICT cohort in the UK. The purpose of this study was to explore the association between IBD flare and total animal protein intake, dietary fiber, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and ultra-processed foods. This uh, cohort is going to be very informative in the years to come because this is primarily looking at patients with IBD who are in remission and it is designed to examine the role of dietary, environmental, genetic and gut microbiome factors that are predictive of relapse in patients who are otherwise in remission. Large cohort close to around 2700 patients with IBD who have been recruited. For the purposes of this abstract, they looked at a subset of patients around 1400 who had completed dietary baseline questionnaires. Roughly half of these patients had Crohn's disease and of these 1400 odd patients, 53% of patients also were in biochemical remission with a fecal calprotectin of less than 50. Their primary endpoint was time to first IBD flare, which they defined either as a soft flare or a hard flare. Soft flare was basically a question of patient reporting if they have had a relapse of their symptoms in the last one month or if they think their disease has been well controlled. Hard flare is what we typically associate with a flare of IBD, which was an increase in symptoms accompanied by an increase in biomarkers, either C-reactive protein and or calprotectin, prompting a change in IBD therapy. They adjusted the analysis for other covariates, including smoking, total energy intake, gender, as well as social deprivation score. So looking at baseline intake of specific food based on a questionnaire, following these patients prospectively, seeing if they experience relapse of symptoms. These are the key findings from this abstract or from this study. What they observed is comparing patients in the highest quartile of baseline meat intake versus the lowest quartile in patients with ulcerative colitis. There was roughly a twofold higher risk of hard flares in those who eat a lot of red meat at baseline. There was no association between uh, baseline intake of fiber, polyunsaturated fatty acids, or ultra-processed foods in patients with ulcerative colitis. What they also observed is that there was no association between baseline intake of meat and risk of flare in patients with Crohn's disease. If you recall, this association between meat intake and risk of flare in patients with Crohn's disease was also refuted in another study that was published from Jim Lewis about a couple of years ago, wherein patients who had baseline eat a lot of red meat were compared with patients at baseline eating a lot of low, uh, not, not so much red meat, and there was no association with the risk of Crohn's disease flare. So the conclusions from this abstract was in a prospective uh, cohort study of diet intake and risk of flare, baseline habitual meat intake was associated with an increased risk of disease flare in patients with ulcerative colitis, but not in Crohn's disease over a follow-up of four years. Uh, what they observed is the calprotectin level of more than 50 was associated with long-term hard IBD flares. So patients who had baseline uh, fecal calprotectin that was elevated were more likely to flare. Uh, my take home from this is that there is an increasing body of evidence, although not very consistent, on the impact of diet on disease course in patients with IBD. This was a nice uh, review from the um, IOIBD summarizing the association between diet and risk of flares in patients with uh, dietary recommendations for patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. For Crohn's disease, the recommendations are to increase the intake of vegetables and fruits and decrease the intake of saturated um, animal fats um, and a lot of food additives. For ulcerative colitis, they recommended increasing the uptake of omega-3 fatty acids and uh, fish. Uh, whereas they recommended avoiding red meat, processed foods, processed sugars, and a lot of food additives. Moving on to data from a clinical trial of a new therapy, potential new therapy for ulcerative colitis. Uh, this was presented by Jess Allegretti, uh, looking at uh, guselcumab for ulcerative colitis. Again, guselcumab, similar to resencizumab or mirkizumab, is an IL-23 antagonist, and the goal of this phase three induction study was to evaluate the efficacy and safety of guselcumab or tremphia as it is approved for uh, psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis as induction therapy for patients with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. This was designed as a phase three randomized double-blind uh, placebo-controlled trial. Uh, patients were randomized three to two to a dose of IV guselcumab 200 milligrams every four weeks versus placebo, 
at baseline or these patients had moderate to severe ulcerative colitis, and their primary outcome was clinical remission, which was a combination of patient-reported outcomes and endoscopic outcomes at week 12. They looked at other endpoints as is expected with most of these induction studies. And what they observed is a greater proportion of patients treated with guselkimab were likely to achieve clinical remission, a delta over placebo of around 15% and a greater proportion of patients treated with guselkimab were able to achieve clinical response. Um, similar results were observed across uh, multiple secondary endpoints, including endoscopic improvement, endoscopic normalization, as well as the endpoint of histoendoscopic mucosal improvement. Uh, the conclusions here is that induction therapy with guselkimab, 200 milligrams IV, is safe and effective in patients with moderate to severe UC. Uh, Further maintenance studies are required to evaluate persistence and long-term safety of Kuselkumab uh, in patients with ulcerative colitis. Um, IL-23 overall is an emerging uh, class of therapy in patients with ulcerative colitis. How do we position this class of medications in patients with moderate to severe UC is to be determined, and I'll talk more about this in the next talk. Uh, next uh, is focusing on a group of patients that are really difficult to treat, um, patients with uh, fistulizing Crohn's disease, primarily perianal fistulae. This was post hoc analysis of the Uparacetinib clinical trials for Crohn's disease. So again, by inclusion, all of these patients had to have luminally active Crohn's disease and symptomatic from luminal Crohn's disease, but a subset of these patients, in addition, also had draining fistulae and anal fissures. Uh, phase three and uh, Post-hoc analysis of phase three trials, again, uh, as Marianne mentioned, these were patients who were randomized to four to five milligrams of uparacetinib versus uh, placebo and uh, followed over a period of uh, 12 weeks for induction, followed by uh, maintenance therapy. This specific abstract only focused on a subset of patients who are draining perianal fistulae or symptomatic fistulae and anal fissures. And their definition of, peri of uh, fistula remission was largely based on no further expression. So if you press on the fistula, there's no further drainage. This was not looking at radiologic remission of fist uh, perianal fistulae. Again, this was a large uh, phase three program for Crohn's disease for uparacetinib. Uh, roughly around 172 of these patients had active perianal fistulae or perianal fissures. Uh, and these were the patients that were studied for this particular post jack analysis. Um, again, the vast majority of people had per primarily perianal fistula, which was about 85% of patients. The vast majority of patients had primarily a single draining perianal fistula. Roughly about a third of patients had symptomatic perianal fissures, uh, here primarily with symptoms of pain. They looked at outcomes of drainage of these perianal fistula at week 12 and subsequently at week 52. And what was impressive is that at week 12, roughly about half of these patients who are draining perianal fistulae along with active luminal Crohn's disease were able to achieve fistula remission compared to only about 9% of patients treated with placebo. Again, this is a very difficult to treat patient population. At this point, our main treatment option has been anti-TNF therapy, and that is the only therapy, particularly in Fliximab, which actually has a dedicated clinical trial uh, for fistulizing Crohn's disease. Post-hoc analysis uh, for uparacetinib does seem to demonstrate, both at week 12 and week 52, a significant uh, rates of achieving perianal fistula drainage, as well as the resolution of pain due to perianal fissures. Um, what we really need is, uh, this is a potential new oral treatment option for patients with fistulizing Crohn's disease, but what, he, what we really need is a dedicated randomized controlled trial of uh, uparacetinib for patients with fistulizing Crohn's disease to be able to understand their effect much better. Moving on to the last abstract, this was the VIEWS trial, which was evaluating patients in Australia who were treated with verilizumab combination therapy. So, patients with ulcerative colitis who are on verilizumab plus thiopurines achieve remission, and then these patients were randomized to either withdrawal of thiopurines or continuation uh, of uh, combination therapy. I do want to emphasize that is this trial was not designed to look at whether we should be using combination therapy in patients who are treated with verilizumab. 
However, the practice in Australia, the mandate there is that all patients who are starting bedolizumab should be on thiopurines and should receive combination therapy. So this was feasible in Australia where patients were on combination therapy by design and then these uh, investigators randomized them to either continuing the combination therapy or withdrawal of the thiopurines with continuation of bedolizumab monotherapy. The primary purpose of the trial was primarily to look at uh, whether withdrawal of thiopurines modifies drug exposure, so verulizumab trough concentrations and development of antibodies to verulizumab, but they also looked at clinical outcomes and endoscopic outcomes at the end of one year after treatment withdrawal. Uh, small clinical trial, close to around 60 patients, randomized two to one to either a continuation of combination therapy in 20 patients versus withdrawal in about 42 patients. Uh, their primary endpoint, they basically demonstrated that at 48 weeks, there was no difference in verulizumab trough concentrations, whether you continue uh, a combination therapy versus withdraw the thiopurines and continue verulizumab monotherapy. None of the patients develop antibodies to verulizumab. This is something that we have frequently seen in clinical practice, wherein this target is not very immunogenic, so the likelihood of people developing antibodies to verulizumab is very low. The significance of verulizumab trough concentrations in clinical practice is also a bit unclear uh, because there may not be a very strong, unlike anti-TNF therapy, may not be a very strong association between sp uh, targeting specific trough concentrations and clinical outcomes. What they observed, however, was uh, differences in endoscopic and histoendoscopic endpoints. So while the trial was not necessarily powered to look at differences in clinical outcomes, there were numerical differences in the rates of achieving or maintaining clinical remission in uh, patients who continued combination therapy versus withdrew the thiopurines. However, for most of the objective endpoints, including endoscopic improvement as well as decline in biomarkers uh, and histoendoscopic remission, patients who continued combination therapy with verulizumab and thiopurines were more likely to have favorable endoscopic outcomes as compared to those in whom thiopurines were withdrawn. They looked at a specific multivariable analysis for predictors of relapse and what they observed is patients with prior anti-TNF exposure and histologic activity at baseline were more likely to relapse over the course of one year. Uh, so the conclusions from this abstract were that thiopurine withdrawal did not have a significant effect on verulizumab trough concentrations or the development of antibodies to verulizumab. However, thiopurine withdrawal was associated with a lower risk of maintaining uh, biochemical remission as well as endoscopic and histoendoscopic remission. Uh, my take home from this is for patients uh, that you're treating with combination therapy with verulizumab for ulcerative colitis and you're making a decision to withdraw the thiopurines, you should probably monitor these patients carefully at the time of withdrawal and over the first six months to see if there's any evidence of biochemical relapse that may be predating clinical relapse. Whether patients who are starting verulizumab should go on combination therapy it remains a question uh, to be answered. Uh, we recently wrote this editorial summarizing the, the body of evidence here, um, looking at pharmacokinetic studies, post-hoc analysis of clinical trials, as well as observational studies. And what we have consistently seen is, what studies have consistently shown is, combination therapy of thiopurines with verulizumab does not seem to affect pharmacokinetics, i.e. the risk likelihood of developing higher trough concentration is no different with combination therapy versus verulizumab monotherapy. The risk of immunogenicity is very low. In the second column, if we look at post hoc analysis of clinical trials, in patients who have failed thiopurines enter into these clinical trials, again by design, in these trials, patients are required to continue their baseline therapies. So if we compare those who fail thiopurines, continue thiopurines during the course of the trial, there was no difference in the outcomes of patients who were on combination therapy after failure of thiopurines versus those who uh, were only on verulizumab monotherapy. However, a very well-conducted and robust uh, target trial emulation methodology of a large um, observational study that was conducted by Julian Kirschgesner seemed to suggest that the likelihood of relapse with combination therapy with verulizumab were lower, was lower as compared to verulizumab monotherapy if you apply principles of observational comparative effectiveness research. So my conclusion from that was most patients treated with verulizumab may not require combination therapy. However, that should not be the norm, and you really need to think about disease activity and disease severity when making these decisions. <laughs>
So finally, um, the take home points again, the reinduction with IV ustekinumab may be beneficial in a subset of partial responders uh, to ustekinumab therapy in patients with Crohn's disease. High meat intake at baseline may increase the risk of relapse in patients with ulcerative colitis, but not Crohn's disease. Thiopurine withdrawal in patients who are on combination therapy with velizumab may be associated with worse uh, clinical and endoscopic outcomes without necessarily impacting the uh, trough concentrations or immunogenicity. I do want to credit Jeff McCurdy, a colleague of mine at University of Ottawa, um, as well as the program that he and other colleagues runs, which is IBD Up to Update, uh, which summarizes a lot of these abstracts that were presented at major GI meetings, and he shared a lot of these slides with me. With that, I'll stop. Probably move to the next talk.